Welcome everyone to our virtual and interactive event. Our title for today is co-designing solution oriented research for sustainable development. My name is Alex. I work for GIZ in a program on marine conservation and it's my pleasure to moderate today's event and guide you all through it on the path towards creating guidance on co-design for research projects and partnerships. That actually is our ultimate goal today, to foster the discussion and also harness everyone's expertise and experiences and contribute towards the creation of a guidance on co-design. For a bit of context, um, today is the second day of the 48-hour virtual event marathon, so-called satellite activities, under the topic an inspiring and engaging ocean. It is the first of its kind. The Ocean Decade Laboratories are a creative, interactive platform to support action for the ocean decade around the globe. So what have we planned for you today? As you can see, there are four sections to this event. I'd like to say that we have hidden interactive parts in all of them. So we will ask you at several points to engage with us, to contribute and to share your knowledge and expertise. Let's begin with some housekeeping. This event is being recorded, as maybe some of you can already see in the bar above. By participating with your video on, we're assuming that you're consenting. Um, if you don't want to have your video in the screen, turn it off and you can still contribute in the chat. That won't show up in the recording. Then the standard rules apply. Mute your mics until it's your turn. Turn off your camera until it's your turn. And importantly at this point for later, if you cannot see the chat, please send an email to ocean at giz.de. We will share links for breakout rooms later and for that you will need access to the chat. There might also be just a necessity to unmute the chat, I believe. So try that first and otherwise send an email to my colleague at ocean at giz.de. Thank you. All right, in the spirit of co-design, we have also co-designed this event for you which means that I have a couple of co-hosts with me here today, starting with Vayamsa. The Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association has a particular interest in promoting collaborative research, linking the knowledge that emerges from research to the management and governance issues that affect marine and coastal ecosystems, particularly in the Western Indian Ocean region. Vayamsa has been doing this for the last 27 years and representing Vayamsa today, we have Arthur with us. With us. Also, the Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research, or ZMT, is an interdisciplinary institute with the mission to provide a scientific basis for the protection and sustainable use of tropical coastal ecosystems. It does so by conducting research, capacity development and consulting in close cooperation with international and national partners. Representing ZMT, among others, is Rebecca today. There are more ZMT colleagues present, just so you know. Thirdly, Future Earth Coast is a global research project of Future Earth. Its vision is to support transformation to sustainable and resilient future for society and nature on the coasts by facilitating innovative, integrated, collaborative and impactful research and knowledge mobilization. And last but not least, Mehrwissen is an initiative of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, and is implemented by GIZ, my employer. The core of the Mavis initiative is the establishment of scientific cross-regional partnerships, of which there are currently 12 being funded. It is also my pleasure today to announce that a new call for project proposals will be published this fall. A special feature of this call will be a funded co-design phase on top of the funded two-year project duration. More information about this will be available on the Mavis website soon. Now onto a definition. Some of you in the room might be very familiar with co-design, others maybe not so much, which is why I've put a definition here for reference purposes. Um, but as some of you may also know, there are many different interpretations in use and therefore another goal of this event is, as I've already mentioned, the creation of guidance for co-design. Now I'll hand over to Rebecca because we want to know who else is with us today and learn a bit more about you. Hi everyone, 
Um, so I want you to wake up now and answer some questions for me. We prepared a Mentimeter um, that you can see now uh, on the screen. You, ah, you already are answering, that's awesome. So please use the link in the chat uh, or navigate to menti.com and use the code that you can see in the chat or on the screen. And please start answering. Uh, with the first question, we want you to reflect how much do you think you know about co-design? So be honest, it's anonymous and you can choose from knowing nothing, never heard of it, to knowing a little bit, having some practical experience. Maybe you've even worked quite a lot with it or on it. Uh, and maybe we even have some experts here present. So I'll give it another, um, yeah, couple of seconds. Yeah, if I had to choose, I'd probably say I know a little. So we can see there's quite a lot of people who answered, I have some practical experience with it, which is nice. Um, we also have people who've worked quite a lot on it and people who know little or never heard of it. So I'm, uh, we're hoping today that the people who can bring some practical or theoretic, theoretical uh, knowledge um, that they can share and people who have never heard of it or want to learn uh, can learn from, from their peers. So I'm going to the next question. Just a sec. I want uh, to know from you what are important elements for co-designed research. Just when you read these questions, what, what are the elements or aspects that come to your mind that you think are important for co-design? So there's a nice uh, word cloud building up with a lot of trust, common understanding, solutions, new ideas, collaboration, humility. So I think we leave it for now here. I am, um, it's an amazing word cloud. So thanks for sharing. Um, I think there's not much more to explain. I can only say that we will look into a couple of things here today, um, for example, into communication and stakeholder engagement and a couple of other things. So thanks, I'll close this now. We will come back to another Mentimeter later so you can leave it uh, in, in your tab. Thanks. I go back to Alex now. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you all for participating. It's great to have a better sense of the level of expertise in the room. Um, but no matter where you placed yourself on the scale, from novice to expert on co-design, we are certain that all perspectives will offer valuable contributions during our discussions. So let's dive into the subject now. We are done with the opening and uh, sorry, we're not actually, we have one more contribution. Um, we'll have a setting of the scene for us by, with a recording by Professor Gabrielle Bammer. She is a professor at the Australian National University in the Research School of Population Health National Center for Epidemiology and Population Health. So she's not from the ocean field, but that's what we wanted. She's developing the new discipline of integration and implementation sciences to improve research for tackling complex real world problems. Let's take a listen. Many thanks for the opportunity to provide the overview, an overview talk for this important session that you're running today. What I want to do is to talk briefly about transdisciplinarity and some aspects of transdisciplinarity that are relevant to the work you're doing, 
And by transdisciplinarity, I'm talking about research that seeks to develop a more comprehensive understanding of the problem, both what we know and what we don't know, by bringing together insights from different disciplines, as well as insights from stakeholders. And by those, I mean the people who are affected by the problem and those who are in a position to do something about the problem. And in addition to developing a more comprehensive understanding, we also want to improve the situation by co-designing solutions with relevant stakeholders. I've put solutions in inverted commas because as I'm going to talk about in a moment, complex problems don't have perfect solutions. They only ever have partial and temporary solutions. So let's talk about complexity. So the, what makes a problem complex is that it's a systems problem, that it contains a lot of diversity, that things are changing all the time, that context is important, that you have unknowns that are important. And when you put all that together, it also means that you've always got to work with imperfection, including that there are no perfect solutions. I'd love to spend more time talking about that, but uh, there is no more time. Um, so let me just leave it there and move on. I want to particularly talk about diversity and um, harnessing diversity, which is one aspect of complexity. So in co-design, what you're looking to do is you're looking to integrate different visions about what we should be doing, different ways of framing the problem, different mental models, interests, values, ways of doing research and different ways forward on the problem. But it's important to understand that there's no perfect integration, that not all differences can be reconciled. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to integrate what we can and to manage what we can't. There are some great tools for integration. Um, there are formal and informal dialogue methods. There are ways of modelling the problem that can help you understand it better and also find ways forward. And there are common metrics, things like dollar values, ecosystem services, global footprint. And all of these can be done in a way that engages stakeholders. So what do we do with the irreconcilable differences? We want to stop them from causing tensions and conflict. And an important thing is to understand that diversity is just like that, that, that you, can't reckon, you can't get rid of it, um, that we are all different. And that understanding can often melt the tensions away. There are some, there are some good tools like principled negotiation or getting to yes, but we also need to do a lot more um, development of tools. I do want to say very briefly that co-design is not always suitable, the context is not always right, and there are other ways of engaging stakeholders in particular, um, which I've presented here on this slide. And the other thing that's important is that it's not just a one-way process, that you're also giving something back to stakeholders. I'll give you a reference at the end for those of you who are interested to learn more about this. I want to finish by talking about the problem of fragmentation, that there's no one place to find all the tools that you need for co-design or integration or implementation. And the teams and communities doing this kind of research are also not unified. So it's not just transdisciplinarians doing this work, but inter, um, interdisciplinarians, systems thinkers, action researchers, operations researchers. There are a whole range of different communities and teams working on different kinds of problems. And there's nowhere that brings all that knowledge together. So I'm going to argue that it's not just the oceans that need you. It's not just your research findings that are important. It's also the process that's important. And it would be great to work together to build the expertise, to build the scholarship and to build a strong alliance through political activity that allows us to lobby for transdisciplinary and other research that does uh, this kind of work of building more comprehensive understanding by bringing together disciplines and stakeholders and that helps improve the situation by co-designing solutions. I want to leave you with some resources. So the references that I've used are here. I also want to leave you with some toolkits. There are some toolkits that are important. And I want to particularly mention the Integration and Implementation Insights blog, for which I've given you the URL right at the top. I'm hoping that the blog will provide you with some useful tools, but I'm hoping that it would also provide you with a forum to contribute the tools that you develop in the research that you do. It's also a way of building community. It'll also give you a way of connecting with others who are interested in this kind of research.
So thanks for the opportunity to set the scene. I hope you have a great hour and a half session and um, I hope there'll be opportunities to work with you again. Bye. All right. I hope you could hear it at the end. It was working as far as I could tell. So that's good. <laughs> Apologies for those issues. Um, I think that was a good overview about transdisciplinary research and co-design. Gabrielle Bama highlighted the importance, but she also shed light on the complexity and the imperfections of co-design. So we now learned that co-design is about integrating different visions, interests, values, and solutions, what she um, called harnessing diversity. But we also learned that uh, we need to manage expectations. So as she said, we want to integrate what we can and manage what we cannot. Her conclusion is actually a great bridge for us into the next section of this event. As she said, it's not just your research findings that are important, but also the process. So let's take a closer look at that process. During our input sessions now, we have divided the process into four pillars and we will begin with the common understanding and shared vision by Professor Samia Selim. She is an associate professor and director of the Center of Sustainable, for Sustainable Development at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, also during her postdoc at ZMT Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Research on Ocean Related Conflicts. Thank you so much for being here, Samia. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you, Alex. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, yes. good evening, yes. actually. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Super, great. Um, once again, thank you for inviting me to this event on co-designing solution-oriented research for sustainable development. I'm just going to um, start with a few key insights from um, some of the work that I've been doing on, on how do we um, bring about this common understanding and shared vision um, in the initial stage of co-design process. Um, next slide. So a bit of marketing here, but it really sets the scene. This is a paper that um, colleagues of mine uh, and I just recently published on reflections on such um, participatory research approaches. And the, and the premise for this is uh, relates to this session on the fact that a lot of the time when we started looking into this, a lot of the time the research uh, questions or ideas is, uh, is, is, is conceptualized outside the geographical social and cultural context of where the research usually takes place on where some of the solutions we're trying to implement and problems are happening. And um, as a result of that, and then after the idea is formed, then we reach out to uh, project stakeholders and partners in those geographical location. And a lot of the time, there's a lot of mismatch um, in expectations, in, in timelines on what the you know, people on the ground, what the actual additional problems that arise. So what we did in this paper, we looked at, uh, we talked to different um, uh, project, global projects across uh, Asia, um, South Pacific and uh, Brazil. And we, uh, we looked at uh, projects that were able to implement or not include stakeholders, whether in the inception or uh, in the actual uh, implementation of the project. Um, and next slide. And what we found were four key insights, which is what I'm hoping to bring um, uh, in when we go to the interactive sessions on the fact that we need to think about timeline, which is uh, which was our first insight that we need to invest in report um, with communities. But you know, as we're talking about the conceptual of the pre-design, we need to invest time in, in talking to other um, researchers uh, in the area where we want to um, do our project and, and, and discuss. We need to have this openness to bring in diverse points of views, which is already mentioned by um, our keynote speaker. Um, at the same time, we need to be aware of this equity issue where not everybody who comes to the table has a voice. And then there's ones who are not at the table as we're discussing. And how do we bring those um, insights in? How do we avoid you know, uh, uh, causing more power imbalance? And finally, this is the last and the key one that I want to get into is the fact that we need to not just think of our research as uh, as the communities we work with as as you know tools as as a you know lab to test our scientific um, hypothesis 
as we go forward into looking for more uh, solution-oriented research as this uh, whole event is about. So next slide. So this is actually um, inspired by a, 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 a session I was in last week at MRA conference where we were looking at global case studies um, and where they had partners from the global north, partners from the global south. And we looked at what are some of these differences that we want to bring to the table and, and, and so that we can come up, have a more common understanding and um, vision to work towards. And one of the things, you know, several items came up, such as the fact in the global north, we tend to be more focused on, you know, on, on, on methodology, on conceptual frameworks, or academic, rich in academic literature. Whereas in the South, uh, there's also a lot more uh, understanding of the multidimensional aspects of the problems we're trying to deal with. Obviously, more obvious things like strong linkage to the ground. Um, and just the last point that in the Global North, there is still, it's a trend to become, we're now becoming more interdisciplinary, but it's still not that, of uh, you know, uh, it's not developed as much in the South. So next, uh, uh, next slide or next part, right? And the last part is the fact that you know there's this trend, and again, not everybody fits in this box, but you know, in the North we tend to be more in the thinking, you know, how do we use these tools? Whereas in the South we're still trying to, you know, what can we, how will we solve the problems on the ground where we're seeing the problems, and and you know, what is driving different people in the, you know, as we're designing the project. Uh, as we're designing, you know, uh, uh, solutions or, or how we're going to tackle these issues, you know, what's driving them and what are some of the limitations of individuals who are in the team. And my last slide. Uh, line. So just to, that's uh, really what I wanted to bring to the table as we go into the interactive sessions that we, you know, as we're trying to have a common vision and come across, we have these differences in disciplines, but also how people are trained within the same discipline. We have different point of views of addressing the same problem, whether it's MPA design or you know conservation or livelihoods, um, and different trajectories uh, and working modes in you know in different places. So we need to bring all that into um, um, you know into the picture as well as we try to jointly come across the same um, common vision and shared vision on how we tackle these problems. Okay, uh, next. Yeah, and next one. Um, and that's really what I just wanted to, you know, bring in my five minutes intro that hopefully we can go deep dive into these more as we go into the interactive sessions. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, Samia. That was brief, but we knew those input sessions would be um, and great five minutes teaser for later. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions, this is to the participants, you can either write them in the chat or keep them in mind when we move into the discussion later. Our second pillar is stakeholder engagement presented by Lisa uh, Vinny Simeon. She's joining us from the Solomon Islands today, so it's very late for her. Thank you so much for being here. She's a PhD researcher with University of Strathclyde on customary law and ocean governance. She has over 10 years experience in policy development with government communities and NGOs and on ocean resource management. Lisa, are you there? I'd like to hand over the floor to you. We can't, we can't hear you. You just have to unmute. I can see you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll turn off my video now for internet purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, Alketa. Good morning. Well, at least from this side of the globe. I come from Solomon Island. It is a state made up of over a thousand islands spread across a large ocean space. It is home to over a thousand finfish, over 500 species of corals, making us one of the highest marine biodiverse countries in the world. But this is home to me and over 6,000 people who speak over 70 different language. With each village as you go, they have their own traditional knowledge and practices. It is a place that the traditional structures still possess today alongside the, the state structures. Um, so, of course, it is a very diverse country um, and a complex situation for me as a policymaker. Uh, when I travel abroad, I observe that 
we are creatures of habits developed out of routines. So take, for example, the public transport system in a cosmopolitan city in Europe. To get to work or to school, you leave home at a certain time and travel on the metro, train, bus, bicycle, or you walk. You reverse this routine at the end of the, each day. Then try and imagine a different kind of life, a different set of routines. Imagine different terminologies too. For example, a village, a garden, a canoe, the sun, backbreaking manual labor and mostly done by women. Picture that against the backdrop of climate change, changing weather patterns, ocean warming, saltwater intrusion and scorching heat. Habits are less structured, rudimentary at its best. It is against this backdrop that I will try to answer why should we engage stakeholders? What are important principles or lessons um, of core designing? And I will pick from the insights, um, uh, my insights on the work that I have been doing so far in the Solomons. So in 2015, I was fortunate to lead a nationwide marine spatial planning process in Solomon Islands. I, I, I'm assuming here that everybody is familiar with the marine spatial planning um, concept. My key role was to get buy-in from the government, uh, but that, that time, at that time, marine spatial planning was a um, foreign concept to most of us. Recognizing the cultural diversity of Solomon Islands, I was challenged. It is a complex um, uh, space. What would marine spatial planning look like for Solomon Islands, especially with the diversity and the diverse norms across each villages? We started by trying to get organized. And this, this part of the, the, the work that we did took us two years. We looked at who our stakeholders are, who should we engage with and why. In the Solomon Islands, Local communities, in this instance, I'm referring to people living under traditional governance systems, have exercised rights over coastal areas. Some even claim that their rights go as far as the eye, eye can see. So you could imagine when one paddles out, their rights continue. <laughs> These rights are recognized by the state. And so with any research in the local communities, one must seek permission before seek permission from these um, villagers before entering and conducting research. This um, uh, process also helped us to really understand who are we engaging in, who are our primary stakeholders, the communities, the, the government, is it the NGO, is it the scientists, is it the donors? And then we also spent time because of the context that we, we were in to, to try and understand the cultural um, aspect, um, the traditional um, aspect, and also the current contemporary state that we're in as well. The, the rights and the jurisdictions under traditional and state governance structures. From that, we were able to then put a, a, a standard narrative and, and try to bring together this common vision. But we call it our ocean story. This ocean story was something that we were able to to take along to inf when we consult with people. And this story was about who we are as, as a people. It looks at our relationship with the, with the ocean. It looks at the traditional um, connection that we have. Um, and having this story, this story was um, the, the, the thing that brought others to come to us and us to them, and we were able to enter into dialogue. We were able to enter into dialogue with government, with NGOs, with donor parties, but most importantly, with the local communities. And each stakeholder was able to say where they fit into this ocean story. So with the marine spatial planning process, we, ta we trained over 20 young um, local professionals and equipped with the story, we were able to go across the Solomon Islands, even to the remote islands, in the western, north, and eastern Solomons, and we sat with local communities, we, we, we sat with governments, and we were able to together design our marine spatial plan. We got engagement and people participated in the drafting of the, this, this marine spatial plan. The success of this process was because we were willing to spend time to understand who should be involved, 
who had vested interest in the ocean space that we're working on. And we were able to also acknowledge the realities that these different stakeholders are bringing. So for me, this is an opportunity for us to ensure that what we, and I make particular emphasis on we, core design at the global, global level is aligned to these contrasting realities so that the goals that we set are attainable by everyone. And I mean everyone, globally in inclusive. That means it's fair down to the people at the community level. Because when you go to the community level, you will have fishermen, gleaners, and even a policymaker like me. The strategies we design for the next decade must work for both of those of you who drive on paved street and those of us who still paddle on canoes and walk on dusty roads. Our biggest contribution to society is enabling local communities to have a voice, to inspire, and to enable traditional systems that have survived to be part of a research process. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Lisa, um, especially for your perspective. Um, I really feel that we are already harnessing the diversity in the room. And I'd love to say more, but we're really short on time. So apologies to everyone, but I must race through. Um, we have a third pillar to go over. And just remember, those are teasers. You can discuss further in the groups later. Our third pillar is communication and science. And Dr. Anna Zivian, Senior Research Fellow at Ocean Conservancy, is joining us today from California. Um, and she will give us an overview. Anna is co-chair of the Ocean Knowledge Action Network development team and serves on the scientific committee of the Ocean and Climate Platform. Great to have you, Anna. Please go ahead. Hi, um, great credit. to be here. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge first that I'm calling from the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Awibi tribe here in Santa Cruz. Uh, it's always nice going after such great presenters because they've already covered a number of relevant and related issues, and it means I'll be reiterating similar messages. Um, communications are critical to all the aspects of solution-oriented research Gabrielle, Samia, and Lisa have discussed. Communications are important both in designing and developing the research, as well as in designing ways for the research to result in action. These are two different but related aspects of communication. And to get from knowledge to action, product, projects should be co-designed from the start. That is, the questions we ask in order to achieve the ocean we want have to start from understanding what we want. And broadening the base of the we, as Lisa just mentioned, from academic scientists to the people directly and even indirectly affected by how we engage with the coasts and ocean. This means bringing questions to the table, not in isolation, but in collaboration, co-design, with a broad range of affected people, and being especially aware of the need to include voices that have been historically excluded, often intentionally, from decision making. And this in turn means understanding that different actors will bring different perspectives, knowledge and values to the table. Developing a common language is part of the solution, especially where different disciplines and sectors may use the same term with a different meaning. Mitigation and even sustainability are some examples of that. But as Gabrielle noted, also being open to the possibility and likelihood even of incommensurability and recognizing that there can be different pathways to common solutions can help achieve those solutions. A key element to be able to hear each other and communicate together, as we saw in the word cloud, is trust. Unfortunately, building trust takes time and breaking trust is easily done. We've heard some examples of how it can be done. Uh, listening, allowing people to frame their own questions, being flexible and open to change can all help. Similarly, being open to a range of different ways of communicating uh, can help connect and cross knowledge boundaries. Storytelling, scenario building, co-producing knowledge and information from the start, even slide presentations, which I tend to eschew, as you can see here, uh, relaying knowledge in different ways, from technological tools to art and literature. 
For the project teams, defining the best ways of communicating can also take time and experimentation. Most projects will need a mix of synchronous, like Zoom calls or in-person meetings, and asynchronous, uh, like email and shared working documents, communication tools, and different digital and analog applications. Uh, for example, I hate Slack, but some teams use it really effectively. Being aware of the barriers to some of these tools, like low bandwidth or different native languages and others, is also very important to ensuring equitable engagement. Developing and testing these different tools when designing and implementing research can also help in communicating to external audiences that may not have been involved in every aspect of project design. Indeed, being able to communicate messages in a range of ways, each tailored and targeted to different audiences, will help those audiences be more engaged and willing to act, especially when the research has been designed from the outset with their needs in mind. None of this is easy, of course. I've gone through it very quickly, and there are a number of questions that I'm looking forward to discussing with all of you in the breakout groups. These include a more detailed inquiry on in how to develop trust with affected actors who are seeking solutions, as well as among the teams. How to establish a common language, as well as ways of accepting incommensurability. How to build in communications along the way, from initial development of research questions, to collecting and analyzing information, evidence, and knowledge, to reporting out to different parties, funders, community members, other researchers, and finally, to presenting options to decision makers and then implementing projects. Um, how to blend digital and analog tools in virtual and in-person meetings, and a number of other questions I haven't touched on. I did want to keep it quick, so. Thank you very much for this uh, really engaging conversation so far, and I'm looking forward to the breakout groups. Thank you, Anna. If you have, you touched upon many aspects, um, which I really enjoyed. If anyone has questions about it, uh, you can also post them in the chat, or like I said, keep them for later. We're short on time, so I'm moving on again. Um, next, our fourth pillar, is the um, sustainability of research. For this, we have with us um, James Cairo. He is a chief scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute and coordinator of Mangrove Research Program in Kenya. Please go ahead, James. And remember five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandria, for this time, and also to all my listeners. I'll start with uh, our African proverb. The, the proverb talks about if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. This is the ocean decade, 2021 up to 2030. And the whole theme is the science we need for the ocean we want. And I've been reflecting a paper by Joachim uh, team. They have been uh, giving us the enabras for strengthening ocean contribution to sustainable development. And what they come in that paper, which is published in one ad, what the enabras are good science, good the, the ocean literacy and finance, and that has to go with a good political will. And uh, so, uh, but I'll give you my contribution would be mostly be in a system I've been working on for a long time. Next slide. I've been working on mangrove forest uh, research in Kenya and mangrove are forests that grow in the sea. They are wonderful and extraordinary ecosystem providing goods and services for the people, for the environment, and for, this, uh, for the biodiversity conservation. For us to be this far, we have been because of good science, of course. But to have good science, you need government support, you need civil society, you need private sector because of financing, you need local community, and uh, of course, the whole donor community. That is what we are talking about, the, the co-designing. And this has to be done right from when you are initiating your work. You have to consider all these partners if you have to move forward. And this has been our enabras, the, the government support, the community, the donor community, of course, and of course, the, the, the local community. Next slide. 
with the type of the support and the partnership, we have been able to move the mangrove knowledge base in the country to a notch higher. For instance, we have been able to work with partners from civil society, the national government, the research, the academia. We have been able to develop the National Mangrove Ecosystem Management Plan. And that's a plan that, again, cannot be implemented with one arm. It needs all partners together. We have been able, uh, last year, 2020, uh, again, working with big, many partners, we are able to include the mangrove in the uh, in the mangrove in the updated national determined contribution to the Paris Agreement. And this has been a big step, an ambitious step. And through partnership, we have been able to enhance the understanding of true value of mangrove ecosystem and the need to restore them. And lastly, uh, working uh, in the bigger wide in our region, we've been able again, working with partners uh, from the 10 countries, we were able to develop the regional Western Indian Ocean guidelines on ecological mangrove restoration. So the key aspect here is partnership and remain focused and we have a theme. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Wow, everyone, we've had four great inputs, little teasers about the four pillars. And um, now you should all have an idea what the interactive sessions are about, what the, what the topics are about. So now it's your turn, participants, to get involved, share your insights, experiences, but also your questions or concerns about co-design. In order to do so, please choose one of the four groups that are shared in the chat now. There should be four links coming in by one of my colleagues. Um, and you can click on the group you want to join, but wait before you do so, please. Um, just a quick reminder, if you have any issues, send an email to ocean at gz.de. Um, and you will now have 30 minutes to discuss. So be back here, please, at 5.15. Um, I'll wait in this room in case there's any issues. Um, but other than that, please go ahead, join your rooms now and enjoy. Second point that actually came up quite often um, is that uh, planning for sustainability in this short-lived research world often means that there need to be uh, changes and adaptations on higher levels uh, with donors and funding agencies um, because um, it it needs time to build this relationship and it needs time for this impact um, and the transition to follow the project because most of the time from the project partner sites the individual staff will move on to other projects uh, will I don't know move up in hierarchies um, so either there is structures and incentives provided to stay and continue working on these projects and your efforts or on the donor side you actually need to provide staff that at least um, yeah maintains this momentum in the transition period so this is really important that um, it's not a short-term thing you cannot plan for it some things will need more time and if you want this then from the donor side, I think it needs to seep in that, um, uh, yeah, that this measures, um, uh, yeah, sometimes just take a little longer. And um, if you have a constructive partnership, then it might make sense to fund it a bit longer than the initial planning phase of the project, for example. Um, Great. But I will, I will share the link because we had so many points that I think are very valid. Uh, to look at, so please feel free to to check out the document um, and enrich it even further. Thank you, Hauke. Sorry to almost cut you off, but short on time as always. Uh, I'll hand over to Rebecca. Group three communication, please. Yes, uh, also thanks to all participants and also for Anna as our resource person. Um, we A couple of things uh, that we discussed was that communication yeah, we were asked for a good recipe or recipe for good communication, but this may actually differ around the world what good communication is. Um, 
So what also can happen is that we are quite easily lost in translation um, between languages, norms, disciplines. Um, so a lot of uh, potential to get lost. Um, uh, maybe a, a basis for good communication is the willingness to share. Um, and uh, also adaptive communication is key. So um, yeah, being in the beginning, being committed and deliberate, but also receiving feedback and adapting your communication strategy with your research partners, but also with stakeholders that you're working with. Um, stay, um, yeah, very effective formats for stakeholder communications are the ones that are kind of designed or targeted to the target group. Um, we also talked quite quickly about uh, our way of communicating in this shared document, which we thought is also nice to allow for, you, you know, working in when you work in a project, working in different time zones, working with different languages, allowing for people to uh, to write if they don't like to talk. Um, so I think I leave it with that. Um, please, please add if you like. I love how short you're being. This is great. <laughs> we can maybe make it actually to finish at uh, 30 past. Um, next group, please run. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Alex. And um, yeah, our group was about stakeholder engagement. And as we all know, this is always a tricky part. But um, of course, so one of the questions was uh, what factors actually can foster stakeholder engagement? And um, we had a lot of uh, interesting ideas or some interesting ideas popped up here, so I won't read all of them. But um, one was interesting, um, for example, that conflicts can also be seen in a positive way, um, especially with regard of understanding each other on a totally different uh, level. So even conflict sometimes uh, can help uh, and it's maybe a possibility to see things even um, with regard to certain stakeholders uh, a bit more positive and also institutional support and funding we all know is very crucial when it comes to uh, bringing stakeholders together so um, the question how to bring stakeholders together is always connected also to the institutional frameworks and that also uh, leads actually to the second question, how to uh, identify or include the relevant stakeholders. And in this context, um, it was interesting to hear or also read about the ideas. And um, for example, uh, the yeah, opinion of a preparatory stage before actually designing a project or how to actually come to that stage where you really bring the stakeholders together is uh, almost as important as um, the process itself and also within um, the stakeholder community uh, an interesting aspect is always the balance of power so sometimes you have people who are more powerful than others and especially in different cultural contexts that could be sometimes a problem so um, that was something what always needs to be considered and also um, with regard to building trust in the beginning, um, when you bring stakeholders together, this is also something what was mentioned to be as a first step um, and how to do that, of course, is always uh, also depending on cultural backgrounds, but um, this is a, a nice way to get started. And the whole topics of um, ethics and uh, to come up with ethical principles for the whole process was also mentioned. So there were quite a lot of interesting ideas. And um, also the third part of the discussion was good practices. And um, especially with regard to communications and uh, with regard to communication issues between the different stakeholders, um, there was an approach mentioned called uh, or so-called nested participation, which was a tool to actually overcome or which is a tool to overcome different kind of uh, hierarchies um, with regard to political hierarchies, but also cultural hierarchies and also to uh, really have a different look at different kind of groups. Um, so I think um, I will stop here and we will all share the Google Docs. So I think um, there everyone can uh, get an idea of what the whole discussion was about.
Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Great. Um, just a, a quick information. Some people see the five minutes up are up. Don't worry, this isn't Zoom. You're not going to be kicked out. Anyone who has time, you can stay a bit longer. Please don't worry. We have one more group left. Group one, Marie, please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. We had a really great discussion um, and I really enjoyed it. And so to summarize our points, our first one was challenges for a common understanding and vision. And so the same thing as I'm hearing from all the other groups, this need for time to develop a joint vision to build relationships and specifically that this time needs to be funded. So you really can take that time, which is really great. I mean, um, given the call that's going out and having a common understanding was the question, but there was also the point of that we don't want to quash diversity, that being different is good. We want to, um, you know, smooth conflict, but not diversity. And then the, one of the main challenges that came up is that serving different goals and interests at different time horizons with different political agendas outside of the project, that is a major challenge. And so we talked about the methods to collaboratively develop a shared concept and shared understanding. And again, um, people have talked a lot about time, time to get every to know each other, everyone in the team, um, stakeholders personally outside of their project roles to sit and drink tea and talk about their hobbies or, you know, um, their families. Uh, there was some talk about the new tools being developed um, with Zoom, with WhatsApp, these online tools and the pros and cons of them, but that the tools to use vision is very dependent on who the partners are and what are the power dynamics and the communication styles. And finally, we ended with uh, recipes for success and we saw a lot of commonalities for trust, respect, time, smooth power asymmetries and continuity, so long term. Um, and I want to close with this really interesting uh, conversation and a contribution we had about talking about the global we and the ocean that we want and who is we. This may not actually be aligned with regional priorities. And so this um, contribution uh, said that seed funding for people in the ocean dependent areas um, is critical. So they could choose what they who they want to work with. So there's pull collaborations instead of sort of push collaborations. And also that we should be aware of scientific colonialism, in the global north, the responsibility of the north and capacity building as as integral to our work. Great, thanks. Thank you, Marie. Wow, OK, those were four interesting groups and as I can tell, really lively discussions. I am amazed at the level of participation, the amount of insights and expertise that was shared. Even though I only snuck into the rooms quickly, um, that's as much as I could observe. Now I was supposed to hand over the floor to uh, two of my co-hosts, Arthur and Sebastian. I'd quickly like to ask, do you still want to give some final really quick thoughts? Uh, thank you. I think we will not say much from my side because a, a lot has been said that is similar to what we wanted to say. Uh, I think there are key themes that are coming up that are very important uh, in this discussion. And uh, across all the groups, uh, we see a kind of a similar agreement in the critical elements that must be considered in core design. Uh, we are addressing more or less the same issues across all groups. And I think I probably picked a few uh, important points, one or two that I think we need to probably emphasize about spending time with the, with, the, with, with the initial phases of project design. I think this has not been given much attention uh, coming from many groups. Uh, a lot of effort is given uh, to when projects are already designed and uh, starting off, but a lot of thought is not given and participation is not uh, given at the initial design phases. We had from uh, Lisa, for example, about spending two years, uh, you know, just to prepare people to have a common vision. I think many projects jump straight into implementation without really knowing who should be involved, what their role is, what their story is. I think these are the new things that we need now to think about. And trust is a big thing that has come across in all the discussions. And as, as somebody said, it takes time to build trust and therefore flexibility and openness, change of mind. Uh, experts must begin to think flexibly and be ready to accept that they can also learn from other uh, uh, spheres. And finally, as Dr. Cairo says, 
if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. Thank you. Those are my points in conclusion. Thank you, Arthur. Yeah. Sebastian, anything to add or should we wrap up? No, are you there? Um, yeah, we can we can come to the wrap up. I don't have much to uh, to add. I just want to emphasize that um, two points. Um, the overall frame of the UN Oceans Decade uh, or a Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainability, it will be key um, that we get the co-design approaches right because there is a lot of emphasis on this. And one point I found um, particularly stimulating was the discussion of who is the we in uh, defining the ocean we want. So there is still um, a debate to be had around this and um, implementing principles of co-design uh, and doing this right will be crucial. We're also seeing on an international level that there is actually more awareness um, happening also on the funders side for uh, the needs um, in terms of uh, longer time and additional resources when it comes to project co-design, such as we're seeing, for example, in the Belmont Forum funded um, project on pathways to sustainability. So there is a move in the right direction. It will be crucial uh, for us as a community uh, to learn and develop uh, the appropriate tools. And so handing back to you, Alex, it's important um, or it's, it's timely uh, that guidelines for co-design will be made available and that there are more projects such as the Mierdissen um, project coming up that uh, emphasize principles of co-design. Back to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Now, at this point, I'd just like to quickly mention how grateful I am, first of all, for all the participants who engaged, but also all of the people who helped me organize this event, because of course I didn't do it on my own. I've already mentioned the co-hosts. It's an entire team and a good three weeks of preparation, and lots of meetings, and I think the result was worth it. I'm leaving the session now thoroughly inspired, and that was supposed to be the theme, an inspiring and engaging ocean. I hope you're sharing in those emotions with me and that we stay in touch. The contacts are listed on the slide. And um, yeah, please, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Have a good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.